you, sister, for that warm welcome and introduction. I had a chance to visit Dallas a few years ago. And because of the pandemic, of course, nowadays, very few of us can go anywhere. <clears throat> but thanks to technology, it's now easy to virtually go anywhere. <clears throat> Just yesterday, we had this big blizzard here. And uh, still, we are all sitting warm and cozy in our rooms and uh, still able to share this um, kind of a virtual meeting together. So very happy and very thankful for the opportunity to come and uh, to share a few thoughts with you. And the topic this morning is Vivekananda's vision of Vedanta. <clears throat> I think that what Swamiji said about Vedanta, how he thought about Vedanta, had left a lasting legacy on our understanding of this great term. When Swamiji visited the West and it was time to give uh, an organizational structure to the, to the work that he, was, he had initiated here, uh, he chose the name Vedanta Society. Now, society is something that we all understand, what a society is, what it does. We have some general idea. But what did Swamiji mean by Vedanta? Why did he call this society the Vivekananda Society? And I think a good understanding of the word Vedanta will help us appreciate better and understand better the role of the Vedanta societies. There are also questions that students of Vedanta Society, who students of Vedanta have in their mind that what is the relationship between Vedanta and Hinduism? Are the two terms one and the same? Is it possible to be a Vedanta student without being a Hindu? Is it possible to be a Hindu without being a student of Vedanta? So all of these kind of questions can come to our minds and it's helpful to then reflect deeply on the meaning of the word Vedanta itself. The word Vedanta has many connotations. As the philo philosophy that guides the way to people in the Indian subcontinent, Vedanta's best expression is found in the books called Upanishads, which are a part of the Vedas. Now, Vedas, we know, are the principal text, the revealed text that Hindus revere. The word Vedanta, as it is often described and explained in many of our centers, is a combination of two terms, Veda and Anta. Vedas refers to the, the Vedas that I just mentioned. Anta can either mean the end or the essence. So Vedanta, it's a lot of, I would, I would have thought Vedanta would be a, a word simple to pronounce. But a lot of people who come across this word for the first time, I don't know why, I don't know how, they instant put an N before this and some like Vendanta. And then if you have a, a spell check, and it usually, the first word it suggests for Vedanta is Vendetta. Like Vendetta Society, this sounds odd. Anyway. So the word Vedanta is Veda plus Anta and understood in that sense, it is the essence of the Vedas. Now by the Vedas, no books are really meant. At the Parliament of Religions held in Chicago, Swamiji said, and these are Swamiji's words, he said, by the Vedas, no books are meant. They mean the accumulated treasury of spiritual laws discovered by different persons at different times. So the Vedic wisdom was translated orally from one generation to the next for several, several centuries before it was first put down into form of book. Now, etymologically, if you try to understand the meaning of the word Upanishads, it comes from two, two prefixes, Upa plus Ni plus Sat, that the root is Sat. And 
Shankaracharya in his commentary describes the literal meaning of the word Upanishad as that knowledge that loosens the grip of existential suffering or that which destroys our worldly existence or that which leads us to the supreme being. So that's essentially what the Upanishads are. That's what Vedanta is, knowledge. Now, they are books only in a very secondary sense. Now, by this time, those of us who have read Swamiji's books and also from other sources know well that the, the, the word Hindu itself does not occur in any Hindu religious texts, ancient texts, the classical texts. The, the origin of the word Hindu is kind of interesting in itself. There is a river in the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent. It's called Sindhu. And when ancient Persians, whenever they had a word with the letter S, they tended to pronounce it with an H sound. So they pronounced the name of the river as Hindu. And they referred that name to the people who lived on the other bank of that river. So it is a geographical term referring to the people living on the other bank of the river Sindhu. Now, when the British colonized India, they dropped the H. The river became Indus. If you see modern maps, you will see a river called Indus there. And the people became Indians. And sometime in the <coughs> 17th century, uh, when the British wanted, to, wanted one word to characterize the religious life of the people in that part of the world, uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't find any one word because there wasn't any one particular term. And so they coined this term while the people are, have been known as Hindus. And so the kind of religion they practice just add an ism to it and presto, you have a new name, Hinduism. So the word Hinduism itself is of a relatively recent origin compared to the long history of the tradition itself. Uh, the word that occurs in the text is really Esha Dharma Sanatanaha. So Sanatana is eternal and the word Dharma. So sometimes people use that from the text to then call this tradition as Sanatana Dharma, as eternal. Mm -hmm. Now, the, whether the word Dharma itself can be translated as religion, there is a lot of discussion and we won't go into that this morning. So it's good to have some background about how the word Hindu and Hinduism originated. Throughout history, it's seen that it's the powerful, those who are militarily, economically, politically powerful, they get to set the agenda. They get to stereotype and define those who are weak. And so all of these terms, Hinduism, Indians, none of these are indigenous terms. These are the characterizations the, the stereotyping that was done mostly from the Western world. Now, among the things that are common to people living in the Indian subcontinent, we know there is an, so many, at least 25 to 30 languages, so many different festivals, different kinds of rituals. It, it's amazing the, the diversity that exists in the Indian subcontinent is, is, is amazing. And yet it's interesting that the majority of the people living in that part of the country, that part of the world, think of themselves as Hindus. And in Swami Vivekananda's Indian lectures, he spends considerable time trying to find what are the common factors, common basis that makes all these people different in so many different ways, all of them think of themselves as Hindus. And among the common factors is that everyone in that part of the world has this allegiance to the Vedas as the supreme spiritual and religious authority. And therefore, in the Indian context, Vedanta and Hinduism could be considered synonymous. When Swamiji, uh, in his uh, talks, Swamiji once mentioned, that since Hindu, Hinduism is not an indigenous term, if we want to give an accurate name to the tradition, 
it would be more accurate to call it Vaidika Dharma. And he said to the, peop the people themselves could be called Vaidikas or Vedantists. So that's where Swamiji referred to the people who, who, who are today identified as Hindus as Vedantists. <clears throat> so that's one way to see. Now, clearly, uh, the word Hindus and Hinduism are, is much more prevalent, it's much more popular. And that's fine. Uh, I don't have any problem with the word Hinduism, but it's good to know the historical context and its connection with Vedanta. Now, if we overlook the origin of the word Hinduism and ignore the real meaning of Vedanta, <clears throat> then it becomes possible to, to categorize and limit Vedanta to be only one of the several schools within the Hindu tradition. Now, it's not therefore unusual to speak about the Vaishnava tradition within among Hindus, the Shaiva tradition, the Shakta tradition, the Tantric tradition, <clears throat> and in the same breath then say the Vedanta tradition. Now, if the classification is based on the object of worship, then they normally say that Vaishnavas are those who worship Vishnu or Narayana or more popularly Krishna or Rama. Uh, Shaktas are those who worship the divine as a divine mother, often as Kali or Durga. Um, the Tantrics have their own tradition. The, uh, the Shaivas, their principal deity Shiva. And so following the same line of thought, Vedantic tradition, therefore, is seen as those who have as their ideal the impersonal being, often known as the Paramatman or Brahman. Now, although Vedas continue to be the primary scripture of all these different traditions, each of these traditions also had their specific books. So Vaishnavas often, although they acknowledge the supremacy of the Vedas, the Vaishnavas often look to Bhagavata or the Ramayana or the Mahabharata for their principal sustenance. The Tantrics have their own, own books. The Shaivas have their Agamas. The Shaktas have Devi Bhagavata. The Chandi, which is a popular Shakta text. Now, if you think in terms of books, the Vedanta, we first immediately think about the Upanishads. <laughs> so, Vedanta is sometimes therefore seen as the philosophy of the Upanishads. In the traditional uh, enumeration of the philosophical schools in the tradition, they often speak about six schools of philosophy. Uh, and they are called traditional orthodox, so they are called astika, philosophy, the Sanskrit word is darshana. So there are six schools of philosophy. There is Sankhya and Yoga. Nyaya and Vaisheshika and Puro Mimamsa and Uttar Mimamsa. You don't have to remember these names. Some of you may already be familiar with them. So among these, uh, these four, Nyaya and Vaisheshika, Sankhya and Yoga, again, while paying their allegiance to the Vedas, they developed their own system of thinking, their own worldviews, which are pretty unique and very interesting. The other two, often called Purva Mimamsa and Uttar Mimamsa, they primarily based their worldview on the insights from the Vedas, with one distinction. The Purva Mimamsa primarily depended on the ritual portion of the Vedas called the Karma Kanda. And they saw this, the Jnana Kanda, the philosophy, the Upanishads, as secondary to it. And the Uttar Mimamsa, which is better known as Vedanta, did just the opposite. They saw the philosophical part of the Vedas as the principal teaching of the Vedas. And they saw that the, the Karma Kanda, the ritual portion of the Vedas, as a preparatory to the revelation that occurred in the Upanishads. <clears throat> so we see that a contraction has occurred that in, it's possible to see Vedanta is identified with the Hindu tradition. It's possible to contract its meaning and just see it as one among the several denominations within Hinduism. Now, a second, a further contraction takes place when Vedanta often gets 
identified with the non-dualistic school, with Advaita. Now, there are non-dualistic ideas found in other traditions within the, the, the religious life in the Indian subcontinent. But somehow, I mean, there are non-dualistic strains found in Shatta and Tantra and Shaiva and all of those, even Vaishnava has this thing. But somehow it is felt or somehow it is described that the non-dualism of Vedanta is somehow different from the non-dualism of these other traditions. So kind of a double contraction. So you, you kind of compress the meaning of Vedanta to become only one part of the Hindu tradition. And within that one part, you kind of compress it further to limit it to the non-dualistic idea. Now, uh, we see that Sri Ramakrishna often used the word Vedanta, not as often as Swami Vivekananda did, but we do find the word Vedanta occurring in the Gospel of Ramakrishna. And <clears throat> we see in Sri Ramakrishna's biography also, <clears throat> we sometimes... <coughs> we sometimes um, um, describe the different spiritual practices that Sri Ramakrishna did as his Vaishnava sadhana, his Tantra sadhana, his Bhakti sadhana, and then make Vedanta sadhana under Totapuri. And just one, besides, of course, this Islam sadhana and, and, and Christianity, sadhana of Christianity, we kind of put all these categories. And then his Vedanta sadhana becomes just one among the many different practices he did. So we see how, how the word Vedanta kind of can expand and contract in different contexts. Uh, we see um, uh, in the gospel, uh, we see that uh, Sri Ramakrishna says, I'm reading from the gospel. He said, there are two schools of thought, the Vedanta and the Purana. According to the Vedanta, this world is a framework of illusion. That is to say, it is all illusory, like a dream. But according to the Purana, the books of devotion, God himself has become the 24 cosmic principles. So you can see uh, Sri Ramakrishna is using the word Vedanta in a very popular way, sense, not, not, in the, not in the way that uh, we spoke about just now. Now there is a conversation we find in the gospel that Sri Ramakrishna had with two monks. And we find both the meanings of Vedanta expressed therein. So when asked to share their thoughts on Vedanta, a monk tells Ramakrishna, we read this in the gospel, it includes, that is, Vedanta includes all the six systems of philosophy. And then Sri Ramakrishna says in response, but the essence of Vedanta is Brahman alone is real and the world is illusory. I have no separate existence. I am Brahman alone. You can see again, Sri Ramakrishna limiting Vedanta to just this Advaita non-dualistic thinking. So the, we always find this tension between the original meaning of Vedanta and the popular usage of the word. And we find, interestingly enough, Swami Vivekananda, who used the word Vedanta frequently in his talks, lectures, in his writings, in his letters, we find all of these ideas occurring there. Sometimes Swami used the word uh, Vedanta are just synonymous with Hinduism, with the Hindu tradition. Sometimes he uses the word Vedanta as one among the several philosophical schools in the tradition. And sometimes he uses the word Vedanta to refer to the non-dualistic school. So we find all of those ideas present. So you have to be very careful when you read Swamiji's lectures and writings, and when you read the word Vedanta, because what oftentimes what happens is, all of us have certain fixed ideas about these words. So I may say the word Vedanta, but it does need not necessarily ring the same bell in everyone's mind. So different bells are rung in different heads, because depending on what our understanding of Vedanta is. So when we read Swami Vivekananda, it's helpful to look at the context. So not just, we see that Vivekananda did not use the word Vedanta in the same sense everywhere. So you just have to be very aware of the context in which Swamiji is using that term. Now, when Swamiji used the word Vedanta in the global context, by that he meant neither the Vedic religion nor just one of these philosophical schools within the tradition, nor even the Upanishads. 
in, in a kind of a, a masterstroke, Swamiji lifts the word Vedanta above all these uh, specificities of a particular tradition or a particular school of thought. He kind of lifts it above its cultural, historical, religious context and uses the word Vedanta as the very basis of spiritual quest. So that's the most universal way Swamiji uses the word Vedanta in, uh, in many of his lectures. Now, etymologically, we have seen the word means the end or the essence of the Vedas. And I said it's from these two terms, Veda plus Anta. Now, the word Veda, we can either look at it as this wisdom that appeared in the Indian subcontinent, but the word Veda, which comes from the root Vid, to know, can also be seen as just this, this, this sup, uh, how would you say it, um, um, transcendent knowledge. And so Vid comes from knowledge. Veda is knowledge. So Vedanta, instead of translating as essence of the Vedas, can also be translated accurately as essence of knowledge itself, essence of that highest supreme knowledge. <laughs> Swamiji says that the, he lifts the, the, the term and, and he always means the principle, the background, the foundation on which spirituality can be built. So it's important to remember, as I said, just keep in mind the, the different meanings, the different layers of meaning, the different depths that are involved in the word Vedanta. Because if you don't keep that in mind, especially this universal idea of Vedanta, meaning the essence of knowledge, we have to be very careful in understanding what this universal Vedanta really means. Because if we don't understand the proper context, uh, it might seem as, a, as an attempt at what they call hegemony or a very kind of a dangerous inclusivism that seems to, to subsume or metaphorically almost like diminish or destroy the, the, the different traditions in the world. Because, and sometimes as Vedanta students, we have to be very careful <clears throat> not to do that because I have seen sometimes people when they are trying to understand other traditions, traditions other than the one they find their home into. Sometimes you see something in a different tradition and say, oh yeah, in Vedanta we have it, our book has it. So the, it's kind of an instinctive reaction, almost to suggest <clears throat> whatever is there in any other tradition is already present in our own. Like ours is so universal, so broad, that other traditions have nothing unique to offer at all because Vedanta is like truly universal. That's not what Swamiji meant. I, th I just want to alert you all to that. So when we speak about universal Vedanta, that is not to diminish or destroy the important contributions made by different traditions in the world. It's universal only in the sense <clears throat> that Vedanta does not seek to contradict, to diminish or destroy anyone. What Vedanta tries to make an effort to see that underlying the apparent or superficial distinctions that occur, there is a, there is a, a, a foundational, foundational layer which is shared in common across religious traditions, across different spiritual faiths. And Vedanta makes an effort to, to see that commonly shared heritage while recognizing at the same time the uniqueness and the, the rich legacy that every tradition brings to this kind of a great symphony of world religions from which all of us can benefit now, <coughs> uh, if you look at that amazing one lecture that Swamiji gave, and if you have not read it, I would encourage you all to read it. He gave it in San Francisco 
It was titled, Is Vedanta the Future Religion? It's truly a path-breaking lecture. It is in that lecture, mostly, but also in a few other places, where we find Swamiji referring to Vedanta in this global context. In this, the sense in which it breaks through all the cultural, national, linguistic boundaries and goes to the essence of our existence itself. Now, what does Swamiji say in that lecture? Um, it's very provocative, very shocking at first glance. Swamiji says, Vedanta has no book, it has no special allegiance to any people, and it has no personal God. <clears throat> now, this clearly, superficially looks very outrageous. No book. We've been talking about the Vedas and the Upanishads all along. And Vedanta has no book. And Swamiji says, Vedanta has no allegiance to any people. Wait a minute. We, we speak about the avatars. We are these great rishis, the sages. So how could Swamiji say that there are no uh, allegiance paid to any people in the, in the Vedanta? And then finally, no personal God, which is again doesn't make sense. Because people who self-identify as Vedantists, they do have ideals, they do have uh, adorable figures whom they worship as divine, that they have a very personal uh, deity, the Ishta, the chosen ideal. So we do find that there are books associated with Vedanta. There are people whom we adore and worship and respect and follow in the Vedantic tradition, that there are these <coughs> divine figures within the Hindu tradition, within the Vedantic tradition. And so <coughs> how could Swamiji say that Vedanta has no book, no people, no personal God? It seems to me that what Swamiji meant was that Vedanta has all of these, but Vedanta does not depend on any of them for its own um, essence. So while Vedanta can take help from books, it can take help from these truly amazing figures in the tradition, that it, it has this enormous play and, and, and uh, scope for bhakti, for devotion, for worship to these divine figures. But Vedantic principle itself doesn't depend exclusively on them. That Vedanta stands on its own while receiving all the help it can from all of these great resources. <clears throat> so if Vedanta doesn't depend on any of these things, what does Vedanta depend on? Does it depend on anything at all? What is the basis of Vedanta? What is that from which Vedanta cannot be separated? Is there anything which is inseparable from Vedanta? There is only one thing that is inseparable, and that is the reality of our own existence. In Sanskrit, the word for that is sat, being, existence. What Vedanta does is it lights up the path to self-inquiry. We can question the existence of anything apart from us. There are people, there are people who have questioned, well, <laughs> nowadays in these days of um, conspiracy theories, people question everything. Uh, even, I mean, there have been people who question whether we even landed on the moon. There are people who question whether vaccines work or not. So people have questions, everything, including does God exist? How can we be sure that God exists? Do we know whether all these Vedic rishis, did they exist or is just a creation of our mind? And what Vedanta says is we are free to ask whatever questions we want. We are free to question the existence of anything. What we cannot, and this is important, what we cannot question the existence of is our own being. No one can say, 
I'm not sure whether I exist or not. It doesn't work because it just, it just logically doesn't work. It's a great fallacy. I can, I can question your existence. I can question the existence of everything around me. I cannot say whether I exist or not. Because then the question is, who is the one who is asking? Does the questioner exist? Does the doubter exist? And so that is an unquestionable fact of our being, my own existence. None of us has any doubt that I exist. That is where Vedanta places its roots. That is where Vedanta is rooted. And therefore, it's very difficult to be a Vedanta skeptic because to be a Vedanta skeptic is to say, I don't know whether I exist. In fact, that's exactly the term that comes in the Upanishads. It says that a person who questions the... You see, and people speak about God and Again, God is one term we understand in many different ways. Uh, the word that gets often used in, in Vedanta, as we have seen very briefly, is Brahman. And Brahman means the, the infinite being, the infinite reality, the vast. But it, it's again, there is no gender involved. There is nothing involved. Brahman simply means the vast, the infinite. Now, if someone says, I don't know whether this infinite exists. I don't know whether this self, the Atman exists, then the Upanishad says, one who says, one who questions the existence of that, it's tantamount to saying, I'm not sure whether I exist. Asatva eva bhavati. Once I say, I don't know whether Brahman exists, or I don't know whether Atman exists, it, it's like saying, I don't exist. And if someone comes and tells you, you know, I'm not sure if I, whether I exist or not. Um, well, what can you do? You will just probably laugh it away or, or maybe say, you know, you better <laughs> get some therapy or something. And so our own existence, that is where Vedanta is rooted. Vedanta therefore asks us, ask yourself, now that you exist, who are you? What is the purpose of your existence? From where did you come? Where are you going? Or have you come from anywhere? Are you going somewhere? So these are the kind of questions that come to our mind. And oftentimes we get so busy with our day-to-day -day activities, we say, oh, this can wait. And oftentimes we never get a chance in our life to ask these questions. Most people don't ask these questions. And if they do, they kind of put them on the back burner and thinking this is not so urgent. There are more urgent things to do in life. But when can we say we have become truly students of Vedanta? When we feel that these questions are urgent, they cannot be put off. How do I know that I will be there to answer them tomorrow or next year? especially in the kind of times in which we live. Thank God the pandemic seems to be going, fingers crossed. But we have seen, we reading today in the United States itself, more than 2,000 people are dying just from COVID, apart from deaths that are occurring in many different ways. Millions have lost their lives throughout the world. How can any of us be sure that if these questions are important, I can, I can wait and say, I'll answer them next year or five years after or 10 years later. We may not be here to answer those questions. So the, the sign that we are becoming serious students of Vedanta would be that we can no longer put, for, put away these questions. We can no longer postpone them. Doesn't mean we are going to get the answers right away, but we are going to start exploring answers to these questions. And that is what Vedanta asks us to do. Now, it's not as if only Vedanta students are asking these questions. These questions have been asked and are being asked in every religious tradition in different ways, not necessarily worded in the same way. It can come in through many different directions. These questions can come. They are being asked. And therefore, um, no matter how these questions are asked, 
how they are phrased ultimately the resolution to these questions can come only through a personal direct experience it's not about what's said in my books it's not about how best i can explain it to myself it's not intellectual at all well an intellectual understanding can help but merely making something very logical or rational doesn't mean anything what ultimately the real resolution comes only when i experience it in the depth of my heart now at present to know that i am a human being i don't need any logic i don't need to look at any book to find out whether i am a human being or not it's directly experienced by every one of us deep down in our heart i am a human being period i don't need any logic behind it but the moment you say i am the infinite one i am the atman i am the pure perfect one say how come that doesn't make sense how do you prove it which of your book says it so we ask for logic we ask for where the books are saying it and that's good it's good to be logical it's good to kind of get help from these the wisdom that is found in these books but ultimately what will resolve these questions these doubts is that i feel deep down in my heart that i am a divine being not intellectual intellectually many of us can delude ourselves into thinking that way but just now just as i feel i am a human being without the least bit of doubt when i begin to feel i am a divine being without the least bit of doubt without worrying about logic without worrying about books without worrying about anything deep down i know i am the infinite being that is the goal of vedanta that is when all the problems will cease that is where vedanta wants to take us and that is the goal and that is how vedanta can be understood in the global context <clears throat> let me read to you what swami vivekananda said about this he said vedanta has nothing to say against anyone whether you are a christian or a buddhist or a jewish or a hindu whatever mythology you believe whether you owe your allegiance to the prophet of nazareth or of mecca or of india or of anywhere else whether you yourself are a prophet it has nothing to say it only preaches the principle which is the background of every religion on of which all the prophets and saints and seers are but illustrations and manifestations multiply your prophets if you like vedanta has no objection vedanta only preaches the principle and it the method it leaves to you take any path you like follow any prophet you like but have only that method which suits your nature so that you will be sure to progress now these are very important words because here we find a very definitive statement of swami ji's vision of vedanta and he clearly distinguishes vedanta here from what is popularly understood as hinduism by vedanta swami ji often refers to what we could say religion with a capital r the religion with a capital r swami ji once said that those are the phrase, that's the phrase swami ji used he said religion with a capital r is the one eternal religion and he continued by saying it is this one eternal religion that is applied to different planes of existence is applied to the opinions of various minds and various races there never was my religion or yours my national religion or your national religion there is only the one one infinite religion existed all through eternity and will ever exist and this religion is expressing itself in various countries and in various ways and this one eternal religion is what swami ji meant that essence of knowledge vedanta translated as the essence of knowledge the knowledge of the mystery of existence 
our own existence and the existence of the world around us. Now, this has to be distinguished between religion with a small r. So long as my own religion with a small r does not inhibit me or isolate me from the positive influences of other religions, being a part of one religious tradition is helpful and also essential. Sri Ramakrishna used to give the example of a, a growing plant. Now, here we don't see it often, although in our garden, we do have some rabbits and squirrels who come and try to raid our, our tiny little flower plants and some uh, vegetables we try to grow. And so we have kind of a small fencing around it in the garden. I'm sure many of you who do gardening uh, feel the need to have something like that. And that's necessary to protect the growing plant. But when that plant grows up into a big tree, Sri Ramakrishna says you can even tie an elephant to it. So in the beginning stages of our spiritual life, uh, we will need some fencing, some protection. And the traditions we grow into, the traditions we find that best resonate who we are, what we value, the, the tradition which becomes our spiritual home, that tradition provides us that protection from these influences and factors which we are not able to protect ourselves from in that early stage. But the time will come when we have to outgrow the need for that fence, when we have to outgrow the need for this religion with a small r and grow into this religion with a capital R. What Swamiji says is the ultimate spirituality. So finally, um, we have seen that the word Vedanta can be understood in many, many different ways. It can be in the Indian context, Vedanta can be seen as synonymous with Hinduism. If you kind of look at it slightly differently, uh, its meaning can be contracted a little bit to see Vedanta as only one among the several traditions in the Hinduism. You can contract it even further, see Vedanta is just one among the several orthodox schools in the Indian subcontinent. If you are still interested in contracting it, you can still compress it further and identify it simply with a non-dualistic school. So you are free to compress it as much as you want or to expand it as, a, as much as you want. But you can expand it if you want. And that is what Swami Vivekananda did so much that it breaks free from all these limitations of language or geographical boundaries and cultural boundaries and roots it in the global context itself. And that root is in our own heart, in our own existence. Wherever on the space of this earth we may be, irrespective of whatever background we come up from, every one of us deep down in the heart know I exist. And that is where Vedanta plants its roots in our own existence. And when this plant in our heart grows, the flowers and leaves that come out of it are the peace and joy and contentment that we experience. And the ultimate fruit of that plant is knowledge. Knowledge that takes away all the limitations, all the limitations that has kept us bound to this mortal limited life, all the limitations that come as a baggage with our human existence. It breaks through all of that and lifts us above. It's then that we know that we are truly divine. So he, here are a few thoughts I want, thought I could share with you this morning about Vedanta, that it's a profound word that needs reflection at different levels. So whenever you undertake your studies and readings and whenever you come across Vedanta anywhere, when you hear about it or read about it, keep these different layers of meaning at the back of your mind. Try to see what the author or the speaker, in what sense the person is using the word Vedanta and to see whether it clarifies or improves 
your understanding in some way. Ultimately, the goal of Vedanta is not that we have to become scholars about it or boast about reading this or reading that. The goal is ultimately to become free, to become truly, in, in a theistic language, we could say to become truly a child of Holy Mother. What Mother would want is that every one of us realize who we are. So that that's the only way to get out of this existential human suffering once and for all. So thank you. And uh, I look forward, if you have any questions or thoughts or comments, uh, I'll be happy to uh, try to answer them. Don't ask very tough questions, ask simple ones. <laughs> Swami, um, I'll wait for the chats to come through, but one question I'd like you to share with us. Uh, this religion with a capital R, which Vedanta is, how does that express itself through interspiritual dialogue? And in your case, in particular, aha moments, and how that expresses uh, Vivekananda as really the pioneer of interfaith dialogue. Can you um, enlighten us? Yeah, every time I believe that we, just like there is an x-ray which can kind of go through the body and see the bone structure within us, if we can have some kind of an a kind of, a, I don't know what word to use, maybe kind of a spiritual x-ray or something, that whenever we hear about different traditions, our own and also others, if we can cut through all the, the theological jargon and all the, the specificities of uh, imagery and symbolism and all of that, and go to the essence of what is being said, we will see that that religion with a capital R is already present. Uh, so it's not that we have to kind of create this religion with a capital R by somehow uh, breaking free from the religion with a small r. The religion with a capital R already exists. <clears throat> we are not able to see it. We are not able to feel it. We are not able to benefit from it unless and until or as long as we are kind of trapped within these narrow confines of a single way of understanding, a single way of looking. And so therefore, I would suggest that it's good, good to be rooted in some tradition, but also to keep our minds and hearts open to learn from a, from a larger field of spiritual life. You have good to have an open mind. They say that have an open mind but not so open that your brains fall out. <laughs> so it's good to be open, but, but to be rooted somewhere so that, you know, yesterday we had this big blizzard in, in New England area and there were fierce winds. If you're not rooted somewhere, you'll just get carried away somewhere. So it's be good to be rooted in some tradition, but yet be open so that we learn from everywhere. So, I mean, there are no chats that are coming through right now. Um, so, I think you, oh, here we go. Uh, one from Betty. I still find it difficult to explain Vedanta to someone who has no prior knowledge of it. Usually, we re resort to describing specifics. I don't see a question there, but can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, it can always be tough. The, the simple way would be, that I generally tend to do when I find someone without any background, I just try to explain the word itself. How, what does Veda mean? What does Anta mean? Essence of the Vedas. Briefly, I mean, pretty much you could say it's essence of the wisdom found in the set of books found in the Indian subcontinent, but the books themselves are very impersonal. So the wisdom that is found in it is reflected and echoed and re-echoed in different religious traditions. So Vedanta can be translated roughly as just spirituality itself, which can take um, historically and culturally different forms, can manifest in different ways in different parts of the world. That would be one way to explain that. Yeah. Very good. Are there any other questions? Uh, here we go. Uh, from Divya. Pranam Maharaj, is it okay to see the general pattern of the one becoming the many in the religions of the world 
without assuming there are no specific distinctions. So much of the ways in which this idea has been transmitted is unknown or has been lost. Yeah, I think it's possible to, to appreciate and, and rejoice and celebrate the diversity, the different ways of expressing it, while at the same time seeing the unity underlying it. I mean, sometimes we just do that in a family setting itself. Even, you know, no matter how um, noisy sometimes Thanksgiving dinners, family dinners can be, uh, and people can argue and fight and do all kinds of things and even relish and tell jokes and stories, recognizing that every member of the family is a different person with their own ideas, some of which you might agree, some of which you may not agree. But in spite of that, deep down, we know that they're all still part of my family. And so it's possible to see the difference, enjoy it, sometimes get frustrated by it, but also see the commonality that exists. And so that's, that's how uh, I found it helpful to learn from every tradition, even if you don't totally agree with every way the things are expressed in every tradition, but go to the essence of every tradition. What Swami Vivekananda used the word as the, the essentials and non-essentials. So the non-essentials of religion uh, can be different. And that's good. That's what brings variety. But the essentials are usually the same. Now, it's a big subject. What are essentials and what are non-essentials? That will vary from person to person. But this is the way Swami Vivekananda expressed it. Swami uh, Susmit asks, um, in the Indian context, Swami Vivekananda asked us to serve the poor and the needy as God. What will be the practical aspect of Vedanta in the Western context? Well, there are poor people everywhere, not just in India. So what Swamiji said about service applies to people anywhere, irrespective of which part of the world they run in. And oftentimes, serving uh, others, seeing the divine in them, might be easier in the beginning. At least because it, it gives us a chance to do something about it. At least we see a person in front, a tangible person, I can do something about it. Because oftentimes people go to a place of worship and you need to a lot of imagination to know that that which is on the altar is living. Uh, and not everyone can do it. Oftentimes people go and just see, oh, there is a, a photograph on the altar, or there is an image on the altar but not that there is a living presence there. And so that living presence we see when you actually go and serve a homeless or a hungry person and feed the hungry person. That's good. But this is also to be remembered that the extent to which our selfless service can be, um, can be truly spiritually beneficial that extent will depend on how much I'm able to see God in my own self. Because what we see outside, it directly related to what we see inside. I'm able to see everyone effortlessly as human beings because I'm able to see myself as a human being. And therefore, I have no problem seeing everyone as human beings. But I have to remind myself, oh, these are all children of God. These are our children of Holy Mother. I don't remember it every moment. Why do I not remember it? Because do I remember every moment that I am a child of Holy Mother? That I am a child of God? So if I become successful in remembering always that I am a child of God, every person I see in front of me, I'll, I'll see that person as a child of God. If I see I am this infinite spirit, every person in front of me will be the infinite spirit. So when we say serve others, seeing God in them, seeing God in others becomes possible or easy or effortless only to the extent seeing God in my heart becomes effortless. That is why the importance of prayer, worship and meditation is important because those are the practices that help me in my effort to see the divine sitting in my own heart. And as a fruit of that practice, then when I go out and see any needy person, 
and try to help that needy person seeing that god has come to me today in that form then that service in fact becomes a worship so the two are interconnected swami we only have 3 minutes left and i'm afraid the next question is a little lengthy can you briefly describe the differences of the various advaita vedantas so it would have to be very briefly i think then please take up read some good book on advaita to find an answer to that question i think um um Swami Nikhilananda's book Hinduism its meaning for the liberation of the spirit has a fairly good introduction that gives these different um, layers of meaning involved otherwise take any other good book especially on non dualism to see the different uh, layers of uh, different schools within us so even advaita is not just one school there are many different schools within it that's the whole problem the more deep into you go into something the more nuances you find and the more division there are so on one hand we just want to experience the one but the deeper you go in this kind of an intellectual study you will see a lot more branches coming up thank mommy you. thank you so much for your beautiful talk it was so clear so succinct and it's something that we can leave with a great feeling of of understanding and so we hope to have you back again this is one of our largest uh talks uh this uh, morning we've had a lot of uh, attendees and we're very happy uh to have them